summer preaching conference or something like that. And my messages usually were, my, uh, when I was invited to preach, normally uh, my goal was just to try to encourage the church. And uh, of course, this is revival, and it's a little different. We need help, amen? And uh, you say, well, preacher, I think I'm okay. Well, that's one of the problems. <laughs> the minute you get to thinking you're okay, that's a problem. Because the minute we get content in our Christian life, we start going backwards. You're either gaining ground or losing ground. You're, you're never just maintaining. Amen. And so God help us tonight. Uh, my boys are going to set something up so y'all ignore them. I think they've gone ahead and went back there to get that. Let's read verses 1 through 7 of 2 Kings chapter number 6. I'll jump right in the message this evening. 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. Now just for context, the sons of the prophets were basically what we would call Bible college students. These were men that were training in the ministry underneath Elisha. And where they were staying, they'd ran out of room, and they'd like most uh, college students, they didn't have a lot of money. So they had to build it themselves, amen? They didn't have the money to have someone else build it. And they're basically saying, Elisha, we need a bigger place. Uh, will you go with us? And we, we need to get the, what we need to build that. And Elisha said, sure. Verse number three, and one said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. I want to look at these verses, and though this is a real story with real people happening uh, thousands of years ago, I do believe that there is some correlation that you and I can make as Christians in the passage of Scripture that I just read before us. I see some things that I believe are very relevant. I uh, was preaching in Kentucky yesterday and drove last night most of the night to get home. And uh, while I was driving home, I listened to pastor's message from yesterday morning, tremendous message on why we need revival and the fact that many times we just get cold or we get complacent, we get calloused. And I just basically, when the pastor asked me to preach this meeting and I was praying one morning in my devotions, the Lord very clearly steered me to this passage of scripture and I believe I'm on the right course for it tonight. And there's all kinds of types in the Word of God, but I just want to show you some things as a means of introduction. And I want you to notice, again, I'll get to my points here in just a moment, but as a means of introduction, the story is this, these college students are cutting trees. They ask Elisha to go with them. They go down to the Jordan River, to that valley where the river was, and apparently there were big trees in that area. And, and this one college student is having to borrow an ax because he doesn't have one, probably too poor to have one. And so he borrows one, and as he is cutting that tree down, or somewhere in that process, the ax head from that handle falls off and flies into the River Jordan. And that's kind of the context of the story, and that's where I want to center my message. But as a means of introduction, I want you to think with me for a moment about this ax. And I was looking at it. There's some things that I think we can symbolize because I believe that ax represents uh, our life and what we as Christians are called to do. Notice with me as a means of introduction, the ax is power. Notice that that axe's ability, I, I borrowed one from Pastor J.D. because I was too cheap to buy one, amen? And uh, he had one. But uh, notice that this axe has no power or ability in and of itself. It's just an axe. The axe was laying over there, right there near wood, and it never even tried to go chop it by itself. This axe has no ability and no, no purpose unless it's in the hands of someone that can empower it. 
May I say that as children of God, you and I need to understand that we are useless unless we're in God's hands. We've got this idea that we can do it, that we've got the answers, that we know this and know that. And I want to remind you that everything we are and everything we hope to be and everything we do is only because we're in the hands of a powerful God. And so I do ask you tonight, who's holding your handle? Who's in control of your life? I mean, in the wrong hands, this ax could be threatening tonight. Husband, if your wife gets mad at you and she grabs the ax, you're not having a real good feeling. Amen? This ax in the wrong hands can hurt people. This ax in the wrong hands can do damage. And may I say, this ax in the right hands can be very powerful and can accomplish a whole lot. And as God's children, you need to understand that who we allow to control our life will either damage or help someone along the way. So the ax is power. I believe that this allows God to use us when we say, God, I want to be in your control and I want to be in your hands and I want you to have my life the way it needs to be. And I'm just saying to you and I this evening that the power of this ax is dependent upon the one holding it. God help us tonight as we start revival. And may I say, listen, don't, don't just spread out the getting right with God. And we don't just need to get better. We need to be clean. Amen. We need to get it all fixed and we don't need to wait well you know uh, somewhere in the meeting I'm going to fix that or fix that no determine tonight that if God has not got control of your life that he's going to have control of it before you leave here the axe's power I noticed the axe's purpose this axe was designed so that it could help someone do something. Whether it be cut wood for a fire, whether it be cut lumber for a house, this ax is to be used not for wrong, but this ax was designed to build and to further someone along the way. And can I say, God didn't save us to sit on a pew and look pretty. God didn't save us, and, and we'd be in trouble if he did, amen? God didn't save us to just be a member of a church and be on the roll, and God didn't save us to just shake hands in a church. God saved us because every one of us has a purpose that he wants us to fulfill. There's something he wants us to build. There's something he wants us to further in the kingdom of God. God wants to use everyone in here, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult and you kids, you don't have to wait to be an adult to be used by God. God wants to use you now. And all through scripture we see that. And I'm saying that we need to understand that many times we get the idea, well, I'm not the preacher so I can't be used. I can't sing like uh, Brother Brady or Brother Dalton or Brother J.D. And I, by the way, I still don't like preachers that can sing and preach. It really bothers me. I mean, okay, you get one gift. But then to get two, it ain't fair to the rest of us. I strip my voice out preaching and God help the people that have to stand by me and choir, amen. And uh, Dr. Martin keeps trying to get away from me and I keep trying to get close. The only way I can stay on keys to listen to him, amen. And, uh, but I'm simply saying, God didn't put you here and God didn't save you just to keep you out of hell. Thank God we're not going to hell, but he saved you because there's a purpose in your life. Can I just ask you tonight, what is your purpose? Why are you here? What are you doing? Okay, I get, I've heard several, serve God. How? See, you, got, you should be knowing as a Christian, and if you don't know your purpose, you need revival. We don't need to be spinning our wheels. What's the point of taking, what would you do if you uh, hired someone to cut down a tree and they show up with their ax and they start cutting and chopping five or six times on every tree on your property? They're busy, they're working, they're making a mark, but they ain't doing what they've been called to do, what they're being paid to do. 
So many Christians are like that person. They're just chopping a little here, a little here, a little here, a little over here. And God's got a purpose for your life as a child of God. And may I make it more personal. God's got a purpose for you in First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. Well, I just thought being a member was enough. God put us all in here for a reason. I've talked to Pastor J.D. a couple times. I know what God wants me to do ministry-wise out there. I'm still praying, God, you put me here. Maybe it's just to, to be a pain to him. I don't know. And if so, God, please let me fulfill that job to the best of my ability, amen? And I will love every bit of it. But God's got a purpose for me. I've told my children, uh, get involved, get in the choir, you know, get in the bus ministry when it starts back. And, and God's got a purpose. God, don't put you in a church just to say it or just to shake hands. God got a reason and this axe has power. It's got to be in the right hands but then this axe has a purpose. What's your purpose tonight as a child of God? And then I want you to notice this axe's position. Wherever the owner puts it is where it's going to stay. It don't have the right to move where it wants. I had asked Pastor J.D. a few days ago, maybe a week ago, if I could borrow it. He said, sure. And, uh, and so I called him today and said, hey, just want to make sure it's okay to go to the house and, and grab that. And he said, yeah. He said, he told me exactly where it was, exactly where I, found, where, where I would find it. And when I went to that spot and I opened the door, it was exactly where he said it had not got up and moved on its own. It was not somewhere else. It didn't say, I don't like where, it's, where I've been left. I want to be in the house or I want to be over here. It was right where he left it. And child of God, there's a great lesson for you and I to learn that many times God places us in positions that we don't like or it's not comfortable or, or says do this or that and we don't want to do that. And so we wind up over here. Do you realize as an ax, it's got to be right where the owner leaves it. Are you where God wants you tonight? Are you in the exact spot he's placed you? Or have you moved somewhere else? And then I see the axe's preciousness. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, I know in our day, an axe head's not that big of a deal. But you gotta understand, back in this day, iron was precious. And it was hard to come by. And, and this man, had even had to borrow this ax. And so this was something that he was taking very seriously. He knew it didn't belong to him. He knew he had to take care of it. If you read over in Deuteronomy, apparently it was pretty common for ax heads to slip off and fall off because God actually put a rule in that if you were hewing wood or cutting wood and it fell, it flew off and hit your neighbor and hurt him, you were responsible to uh, recoup them and take care of them or whatever it may be. And so it was a pretty common problem. But this man knew that it was borrowed, that it didn't belong to him. And child of God, may I say, to you and I tonight that we don't belong to ourselves. The Corinthians said we've been bought with the price. We're to glorify God in our bodies and our spirits. What we've got is precious. God's given to us and we don't need to blow it tonight. I want to deal with this thought tonight. Using that ax is just what I said. I want to deal with this thought slipping in the midst of service. Slipping in the midst of service. And let me show you some things that I see in the story tonight that I hope will be of help to you and I. First of all, I want you to notice the place of this slipping. Where did this axe head fall off? Notice the Bible said that they were in verse number two. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. In verse four, so he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Now, maybe this doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but I just want to say when I read that, it immediately grabbed my attention because Jordan is not just any old place. Jordan was a special place. Joshua led Israel into the promised land through the Jordan. Elijah was taken into heaven by, by, by that whirlwind in the Jordan. 
This is where Elijah and Elisha parted the Jordan waters on his final journey. This is where Naaman, just a, one chapter earlier in our text, was healed of his leprosy, was in the Jordan. This is where David crossed to escape from the rebellion of his son Absalom. And this is where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. May I say, this Jordan River was not just any old normal place. It was a special place. And may I say, I've got the privilege of being a lot of places, but there's not many places like First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. It's not just an ordinary place. It's a special place. I can't tell you the churches that I'm getting in, and the preacher says no one's been saved all year. The baptistry's cold. No one's being baptized. No one's being added to the church. No one's growing. No one's maturing. The services are dead. There's no life. There's no excitement. Hey, you better understand something. I know you hear pastor get up, and he got, he's got that pastor J.D. smile that only he can have and he says great things are going on around here I'm telling you you get out there you'll find out just what kind of church you've got and how good we've got it hey this ain't we ought to thank God not in a prideful sense but you ought to thank God God puts you in a place where the word of God is preached where the singing of God is going on where the work of God is being brought forth this ain't a normal place thank God it's a special place and God's letting us be a part of it. Amen. You say, well, preacher, that's easy for you to say. No, no, no. When God said my time at Emmanuel was done, I could have gone anywhere. This is where I wanted to be. We're in a special place. Do you realize God's placed you in a special place? But not only do I see that it's a special place, but may I say it's a submissive place. Watch now what the Bible said. They asked in verse 3, Elisha, I pray thee, go with thy servants. And he answered, I go in verse 2. They said, hey, we need to go to the Jordan and cut down wood. And they said, he said, go ye. In other words, the man of God, the man that was voice of God in that day is basically saying, this is what what you need to do. They're not out of the will of God is what I'm trying to say. They're doing exactly what they've been instructed to do. I'm talking about the place of slipping. See, you can be in a special place and some things still slip. You can be a submissive person. Preacher, I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. I'm here for soul winning. I'm here for special events. I have given the faith building offering. I'm here on Monday night of revival. I mean, what more do you, listen, you may be a submissive in a submissive place. This man was. He's in a special place. He is, he's in a submissive place. He is in a serving place. He's not flipping his thumbs. He's working. He is working for God, chopping down trees so they can build a dormitory bigger to train men to be men of God. And while he's serving, while he is in the will of God submissive, and while he's in a special place, this is where the slipping occurs. See, somehow we've got it in our mind, as long as I show up at church and as long as I'm in a good church and as long as the preacher's preaching right and the singing's good and, and as long as I'm doing the right things, then I'm okay. Not so. You need all those things. But understand, even with every one of those things, the ax head can still slip. So I see the place of the slipping. Secondly, not only do I see the place of the slipping, but I want you to notice the peace that slipped. Notice in verse number five, but as one was felling a beam, the ax head fell into the water and he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. The ax head falls off. Slips, it's loose, and it comes off. What, what is that axe head, preacher? That axe head is what makes the axe valuable. That axe head is what makes 
the axe useful. And that axe head is what is the whole point of the axe. See, it don't matter if it's an acrylic handle. It doesn't matter if it's a plastic handle. It doesn't matter if it's a metal handle. It doesn't matter if it's a wood handle. It doesn't matter what color the handle is. What makes the axe useful and valuable is the head on the axe. And that head represents the relationship you and I have with God. That head represents the power of God in our life. And can I say that if we're not careful, and Pastor alluded to it Sunday morning, we will go through the motions. We will sing because we've got great voices or preach because we know how to do it or, or we will play instruments because we're good at it or we will soul win because we know all the points and the steps or we'll sit in church and as he said, we know when to stand and when to sit and what's going on and we go through all the motions but the problem is there's no relationship with God. It's routine. It's mundane. We're going through the motions. Hey, listen, there's no personal relationship with God. Preacher, I don't understand that. If you're married, you do. Just because you're married and live under the same roof don't mean things are right. And just because you go to work and pay the bills and she goes to work and helps or whatever the case may be or whether she stays home and you go to work or you stay home and she goes to work or you cook and she don't or, or she cooks, and whatever it is, you can go through the motions, you can sleep in the same bed, you can live under the same roof. It doesn't mean that everything's good. We got this idea, as long as I'm doing the right things, everything's okay. Has the ax head slipped? When's the last time you've been to an altar? Well, preacher, I can't, I can't kneel. I understand that. I'm not fussing at you. But you know, we got front pews you could come and sit on. Well, what would people think? See, that's the problem. See, you're more concerned with someone's opinion of you than you are the power of God. Well, preacher, if I, if I really have God's power, I'm afraid he may want something from me. So you're more concerned with your will than God's will. Preacher, I mean, if, 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 I, if I really keep the ax head the way it's supposed to be, what's it going to cost me? So you're more concerned with what you can have or not have or do or not do than you are the power of a living God. I'm asking you tonight. See, that ax head can represent many things. It represents the power of God. But how do we keep the power of God? It's not complicated. We got to be in church. We got to pray. We got to read our Bible. We got to stay holy. We, we can't just be part of the filth of this world. And so many Christians want God on Sunday and the devil Monday through Saturday. And you can't have it that way. You can't listen to the world's music six days a week and then sing the praises of God and keep the ax head on. You can't live any old way you want to live out there and then come to church on Sunday and put on your church clothes and your religious clothes and expect everything to be okay. Are y'all listening to me? I'm saying tonight, listen, God said that, listen, that that, that ax head, it fell off. And when that ax head fell off, now we've got a problem because that ax becomes useless. What has slipped in your life? Well, I know I'm not reading like I'm supposed to. But I'll fix it. You're in trouble. Well, I know I don't pray like I used to. No, no, no. You're in trouble. Well, I know I don't fear from God like I... You're in trouble. I'm asking you tonight. Has the axe head slipped? <clears throat> Jesus put it like this. He told his disciples, he asked the question of them, what do ye more than these? See, religious people can be nice. Religious people can go to church. Lost people can be kind and give. Religious people can do religious things. What supernatural is going on in your life tonight? When's the last time you had victory over something? Well, I'm not in the RU, so that's the only ones that need victory. <laughs> See, they're just honest enough to admit they need it. I was talking with a pastor this weekend, 
And he said, Brother Treadway, one of the hardest things I do is just trying to stay balanced. Can I say, if you're honest, that's the hardest thing anyone does. Do you have the power of God on your life tonight? When's the last prayer that you prayed know that God answered for you personally? When's the last time you give the gospel under the anointing of God? When's the last time you sang a song and, and it grabbed a hold of your heart, not over emotion, but because God was speaking to you? When's the last time a message changed your life? See, here's the Bible said in Corinthians, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. He didn't say preaching is foolish. And if you know what the word foolish means, it doesn't mean crazy. It doesn't mean, we got preachers that thinks preaching should be foolish. Foolish means not obeying, not listening to what we know to do. Not changing when we get wisdom and understanding. Foolish is the opposite of being wise. And God said the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. One of the greatest marks of being saved is not if you like preaching. I've got lost people living in wicked sin that will tell me they love listening to me preach and they'll, they'll be watching tonight and they're living in gross immorality and sin and not right with God but they like my style. They like my ability and so they're tuning in tonight and listening. Can I say that means nothing. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It means foolishness means you're not listening. You won't obey but to them that are saved unto them that are the saved it is the power of God that word power is the Greek word dunamis it means changing transforming blowing up power one of the greatest evidences of God working in your life is not that you like preaching it's not that you think brother JD gave a good message or pastor will or brother Brian or any of the other men that preach in this pulpit which have some of the best preaching you could ever hear it's when you can walk away and say that message changed my life not because of the man that preached it but because of the God that I serve and the God that was working in my heart when's the last time a message changed you pastor preached it's here about a month I, I told y'all in the message I, I was feeling sorry for myself I'm not a pastor woe is me no one likes me everyone hates me I'm gonna go eat worms God's done with me. I've been, and he preached a message. And I loved him, and at the same time, I wanted to slap him. An invitation was given. And I come forward, and I said, God, he's right. You're right. And God changed my mindset like that. It wasn't just a little bit later, Brother Adrian Burden was through here. Adrian's a friend. I'm the one that recommended him to Pastor J.D. Love Brother Adrian. I didn't expect him to preach to me. He talked about what are you doing? For the, and I thought, here I've been sitting in the church and all I've been thinking is, man, we need to be loved on and helped and cared. And, and God said, hey, get out of that. What are you doing? Who are you helping? I got on the altar and said, God, change me. I've not been the same since. I, I could go on. You understand what I'm saying? Tell me when's the last time a message changed you. Not for a day, not for hours, not for a week. Tell me the messages that's going. By the way, there are life transforming messages being preached every week from this pulpit. But the Bible said the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Unto us that are saved, the saved, it is the power. You know what's going to change your life? Thank God for good singing. Thank, it's going to be the preaching of the Word of God. That's why it's premier in this church. That's that axe head. Has it slipped? Do you walk out of service the same way you come in? Don't blame the preacher. It ain't his fault. By the way, can I just put this plug in? He didn't ask me to. Don't ever come to me and complain about the church or that man. Because I will put you in your place and will not be kind about it and then we'll just get right with him and God later. I'm just telling you. 
You're not going to say a word about him or his wife or his children to me, period. You don't ask me my opinion on things you may think I disagree with him because I'm going to tell you, go talk to him. I am behind him 150%. By the way, there's very little we don't agree on other than I'm better looking and smarter than he is. And one day he'll figure that out, amen. Listen, I'm just a plug. I mean, I've had a few people say, you know, well, what do you think about this? I think whatever he thinks. You're not going to sow discord in this church by turning me against, I'm for him, I'm behind him. You'll never hear me say anything. If I disagree, you'll never know it. That's the way a church ought to operate, by the way. Well, is he going to do everything you like? No. I told you. He preaches and I want to smack him because he gets under, he gets in my briar patch. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, I pastored a long time and preached. Who's he think he is? I tell you, he's God's man. Has the axe head slipped? You walk out. Well, Pastor J.D. missed it today. I don't know what's going on with him, but I'm just not being fed like I used to. You know, I just, I just can't. I just don't know what's going on with our church. It's just not what it used to be. Maybe you're not what you used to be. I see the peace that slipped. Let me say thirdly, I want you to notice the problem of this slipping. The axe head slips off. Now I went out today and bought just a handle. What good is this? Now before you laugh, we got a lot of Christians. Spinning their wheels. The axe head's off. The power of God's not there. You know, listen, you know you're not where you need to be. You know that area that's not right. And you're just whacking away and soul winning and praying and coming to church and singing whatever it is. Can I tell you, you may look busy. You may look like you're doing good. But you are doing nothing. This is useless. Satan's goal is to cause every Christian to act independently from God. And unfortunately, many Christians act as if the axe head is still on. And we're just going at it. You know what eventually happen if I keep doing that? So much for taking it back. <laughs> I'll splinter, Brother Eric, I'll splinter and break and frazzle that handle and it'll become useless. Some of you are at the point of breaking tonight. You're blaming the church, you're blaming your spouse, you're blaming this one, that one, you're blaming the preacher, I don't like this or that, you're blaming, the, blaming God, he ain't been fair. And the whole problem is you're sitting here acting like you still got an axe head. What good's it doing? Nothing. I come to church, preacher. I sing in the choir. I do this. and No, no, no. The problem is you let it slip. And you're acting as if it's still on. This man had a mind to work, but not watch. An axe head don't slip on its own. It got loose. I, the, the axe heads I grew up using and used, listen, many times we had to take nails and put on the end of it to tighten it back down because the shim in there got loose and the wood shim didn't hold it no more. And so you'd take nails or whatever you could to tighten that axe head back and to make sure that it was secure. And that man was just cutting away, but he never stopped to see, is the axe head tight? Is it loose? Is it coming off? Is everything okay? And before the axe head ever slips off, what happens is it gets loose and we don't secure things and tighten things down and then before we know it it's gone and unfortunately we just keep whacking away like everything's okay 
I'm afraid many have lost their edge and they're still swinging. Acting like there's no problem. This man was working for the Lord, cutting a tree to build a dorm for sons of the prophets. And while he's working, the power of God, the power source was gradually slipping away. I'm just asking you tonight, what slipped in your life? Preacher, I just don't think that can happen. I remind you of Samson. Delilah finally figured out what it took, had those guys come in, cut his hair, and the Bible said Samson got up and wist not, wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed, the power of God had left him. You keep doing this, it's going to vibrate your hands. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm the one holding this, and after a little bit, I'm going to say, this is pointless, and I'm going to throw it down. Now, I'm glad God don't throw us away. But what, what can God do with this? Well, God, you can do anything. Here it is. This is the best you're going to get. Have you lost your edge? Has it slipped? I'm afraid many times we keep swinging and acting like everything's okay, coming to church, smiling, oh, we know how to do it, shake hands, how, how you doing? Everything's good and great, and we know good and well, it's not. And I think a lot of that has to do with pride. We just don't want to admit there's a problem. And pride's like a beard, it's always growing. And there's only one solution, you've got to shave it every day. You've got to cut it out every day of your life. Let me say, lastly, not only do I see the problem, but notice fourth and finally, the process to recovering. Preacher, okay, the Holy Ghost is, maybe I've not mentioned what the Lord's dealing with you about. And I've not tried to be too specific, because here's what I learned a long time ago. The Holy Ghost knows how to pinpoint in your life what you need way better than I do. Okay, preacher, I, I see maybe there's some areas that slipped in my life. How do, I, how do I fix it? Well, I believe the answers are found right here. First of all, you've got to recognize it's gone. Look at verse number 5. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master! One thing I'll say for this man, he may not have done a good job of making sure that it stayed tight and checking it before he started. My daddy taught me cutting wood years ago. You always check the ax head. You always make sure it's secure. You wiggle it and kind of hit it up against a tree and a log. Make sure that it's not going to move on you. That guy didn't do that, but at least he had enough sense when it slipped off to cry out and say, hey, this thing is no longer on there. Do you realize it's gone tonight? Sometimes pride will cause us to be blind to the fact it's gone. You're never going to get it fixed until you admit or recognize it's not there. Before we moved here, a um, few weeks before we moved, we were out cleaning something in the yard there in Abingdon and I don't remember what I was doing, but it involved using my hand a lot and where I've I lost quite a bit of weight. My wedding ring is still pretty loose sometimes and I, my hands were wet and somewhere in that process, my wedding ring slipped off and I didn't even know it. And kids were helping me out there and a short time later, I went and to the house and didn't pay any attention, didn't realize it wasn't there and sometime that evening, I, I, I looked down and I said, wait a minute, my wedding ring's not on. It would have never been on and would have stayed lost had I not recognized it wasn't there. You're never going to get help until you admit you got a problem. You, you're going to have to come to the place that, that you realize and sometimes the hardest thing is just admitting it's gone. You're going to have to recognize it's gone. Secondly, you're going to have to reach out for help. Do you notice what he did? The minute he realized it was gone, alas, master. Now, we don't use that word alas, but I looked it up in the Hebrew. It basically just means, ah, 
We know that one. He, he's in a crisis. He borrowed this. And the law was if you borrowed and lost something, you had to replace it. And we know he ain't got no money. He, he didn't have money to buy one himself. He had to borrow one. He's in a world of hurt. He realizes it's gold. And immediately he cries out, Alas, Master, who's he talking to? He's talking to the man of God. You know, it's amazing. When we get in problems and trouble, we want to cover it up. We want to hide it. We get too prideful. We don't want to tell no one. We don't need no help. Uh, we, we think we don't need any help. But can I tell you tonight, you're never going to get it back until you reach out. Till you say, Pastor, I need to talk. Or you get on an altar and say, God, I need to fix this. Or you grab that person that you're not right with and say, hey, we got to get this right. It will never get fixed till you realize, till you recognize it's gone. And until you reach out for help, he realized he could not do it on his own. You can't either. We need God, and we need one another. How do you get it back, preacher? Recognize it's gone, reach out for help. Number three, remember where it fell off. When he shows up to the man of God, the first question Elisha asks is, where fell it? How did you lose your cutting edge tonight? You haven't lost his presence. He lives in your heart. You, you've, you've not lost your salvation. You can't lose it. But we can lose the power, the indwelling power of God. We can get to where we're not walking in the Spirit. We're not being filled with the Spirit of God. you got all the Holy Ghost of, that you're going to get at salvation. But the goal is for Him to get more and more and more of you. Where fell it? Are you disobeying God's word? Are you playing with the sin in your life and excusing it, just on the outer edges of it? Are you bitter, unforgiving? Have you allowed yourself to be lifted up with pride? Are you rebelling against authority instead of submitting? Are you jealous or envious? Are you refusing to witness to someone God's laid on your heart? I'm just saying tonight the list could go on and on and on. Where fell it? Did it fall late at night on the computer, sir? Instead of being with your wife? Did it fall in a cabinet somewhere at the liquor store? Where fell it? You know where it fell. The man of God said, where fell it? Where'd it go? Many times... One of the hardest things we'll ever do is just admit sin in our life and level with God about what's really there. You've got to recognize it's gone. You've got to remember where it fell. You've got to reach out for help. And then lastly, you've got to be responsible to obey. This amazes me. Verse 6, the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. This man shows the man of God the place. Elisha cuts down a stick, cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. I need help. Elisha says, okay. I don't know what the stick represents. I, I, I read guys say it represents Calvary. I don't know that I want to take the typology that far. I don't know uh, if you read other places. When he cast salt in to fix something. He cast meal in something. He cast a tree in to fix them bitter waters. I don't know what the purpose of the stick was unless it was just to show him he was doing something. I don't know. But he throws the stick in. But what I do know is this iron head. Iron don't float. Why didn't he just have it float right into the hands this man asked for help and here's what I believe God did for the man what he couldn't do but the minute it was back within his reach it's now up to him 
You can't find it in the Jordan. You don't know where it's at. Okay, fine. God is going to help you. He raised it in the water, but then the man of God said, reach in and take it. What that tells me is there's a responsibility on my part. Oh, God, just take this anger from me. No, God says, take, get rid of it yourself. He's give you the tools. He gave you the Holy Ghost. He gave you a Bible. He gave you resources. And many times, flee fornication. Hey, listen, and on and on, there's the responsibility of the believer. We need God's help. And when we go to God and say, God, I need something, he will do what we can't do. But he expects us to do our part. And this man has a decision to make. If I want the axe head back, I mean, God could have floated it right into his hands. God could have floated it right back on the, God could have put a supernatural weld on that thing that it never come off again. But that's not what God did. God said, I'll do what you can't do, but then it's up to you. You know, I, I, the more and more I serve God, the older I get, the more I, I know in my own life and I'm convinced we make serving God a lot harder than we need to make it. And at the end of the day, it's a decision. It's a decision. You get up in the morning and you decide whether you're going to live for God or whether you're going to pray or whether you're going to sleep in. You decide whether you're going to read your Bible or look at Facebook. You decide whether you're going to start your day or whether you're going to make sure God has time. You, you make the decision. We make it a lot harder than it needs to be. And then when things don't go right, we blame God and say, well, that Bible's not right, church's not right, because look at the mess I'm in. No, no, no. Somewhere along the way, the axe head slipped. If you got work to do, and I'm closed and I'm done, you got to cut trees, you got to cut firewood, you got to build something, which one you want? Which one you picking up? Which one you leaning on? Don't get mad at God that you're sitting there stagnant, no power, no one being saved. Here's, here's your choice, and here's his choice. Which one would you use? I want to make sure, Brother Clarence, that that head don't slip. I'm a worthless handle without the power of God in my life. I can't live for him. I can't serve him. I can't be a good husband. I can't be a good daddy. I can't be a good preacher without this. All I'm doing is whacking away and doing absolutely nothing. And we need revival tonight because I'm preaching to a good church, a special place. But I just wonder how many. It used to be this. Somewhere along the way, it slipped. Now this is it. And no one else may know it, but you do. Maybe the head's not off, but maybe it's getting a little loose and you ain't even doing the things to tighten it back down. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to ask you tonight. Has something slipped? As I was studying for the message, God, I told the Lord to speak to my heart, and he did. The Lord pointed some things in my life that I needed to shore up. I don't preach to you as one that's arrived. I don't preach to you as one that has all the answers. I just preach to you as one that needs revival and knows that if we don't have the power of God in that sharpened axe head, we're not going to do anything. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder how many say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. Just pray for me. Just put your hand up. I'm not going to come to you. Embarrass your hands up all over. Right now, would you just slip out of your pew? Come to the altar. If you can't kneel, sit on the front row. Show God you mean business enough that you're going to fix it. You got to realize it's gone. You're going to have to reach out for help. You're going to have to remember, you know where it, where it fell. You're going to have to deal with that tonight. And then you're going to have to be responsible to do what God says do. Make that choice tonight. I don't want, I don't care if anyone remembers this message. I really don't. But if you walk away from here changed, 
better Christian, sharpened, doing something for God, then I've succeeded with God's help. Father, Lord, I ain't preached to impress. Nothing impressive about my message tonight. I preached with a burden. I know the pastor's burden. God, I, I've done my best to say everything you want said and nothing more. And I'm asking you tonight to change us. Start with me. Our pianist is playing that great song, Nothing Between. God, would you take anything and everything out of our lives? It's going to cause that axe head to slip off. God, there are souls that need to be saved, lives that need to be changed, hearts that need touched, the kingdom of God that needs to be furthered, and you need people with a sharp edge. May we be honest with you tonight, and may we get some help. Use the message, challenge us. In Jesus' name. appreciate Brother Trevor preaching. We'll close in just a minute in prayer. After we pray, we'll be dismissed. But I appreciate you preaching, my friend. Touched my heart. I think you're waiting for an opportunity to preach back at me. Appreciate that. Lord, touch your heart tonight. Amen. I liked what he said, that God will do what you can't do, but he won't do what you're supposed to do. And thanks, my friend. I like that question, too. Where did it fall off? We normally know, don't we? We normally know. At least I know. I know about you. I know. The Lord touched my heart, and I appreciate that. It's a good first night of revival. And I'm excited to come back tomorrow night. Amen. Excited to hear what God has for us. Brother Trevor's going to preach tomorrow night as well. And uh, there goes the crowd. That's what he said. <laughs> Yeah, well, like they say, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but maybe tonight, the Lord touched your heart and you didn't respond completely. All right? Do me a favor before the night's over. Do business with God. If you need to stay around here and pray some, you're welcome to. If you need to take the, wrong, the long route home, that's okay as well. My friend, don't wait. Don't wait. Life is too short. God is too good. Can you imagine if what God can do with this church if we all just keep our eyes on him? It's already an amazing place to be, but if we all get on fire for the Lord, let him use us, there's no telling what he can do. Not because us, we're nothing. We're nothing. And he'll do the supernatural, but he won't do what we're supposed to do. Well, I'm going to dismiss this in prayer. And we're not taking an offering tonight. We're not going to take one tomorrow. We'll take one Wednesday night, just so you know. All right? But um, I'm excited for what God's already doing. I touched my heart, touched many hearts that appeared as well. And you be in prayer for tomorrow night. You be in prayer that God will again touch us. 
And thank you, my friend, for preaching the Word of God. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for Brother Treadway as he preached, Lord, but thank you for your message from your Word. And Lord, I pray that if there's an area that we've allowed to slip or not short up, Lord, that we would have done business with you. Lord, that we would have come back to you with humility. Lord, I love that part in the story when the man reached out, you reached down. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness and mercy and compassion. Lord, thank you that you're not done with us yet. And Lord, you're faithful to us. Lord, I pray everyone who made a decision tonight that you would, that you would shore up, Lord, and strengthen those decisions. Lord, I pray already for the service tomorrow night. Lord, we don't know if we'll be here, but we're planning on it. We're planning on, again, you meeting with us. Lord, help what happened tonight, and we're praying for Tuesday and Wednesday to not just be a one, two, three night hurrah, Lord, but to be eternal. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.